is at the beginning of a new political era in Iran. So-called moderates make strong election gains to boost President Hassan Rouhani. But how close is he to the heart of power in the Islamic Republic? And how is Iran being viewed now regionally and around the world? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. Elections last week in Iran were seen as a test of the people's support for last year's nuclear deal, as well as a gauge of where Iranian politics is headed. On both counts, President Hassan Rouhani can claim a significant victory. Almost every prominent critic of the deal was defeated. In Tehran, reformist allies of Rouhani took control of the entire 30-seat bloc in parliament. Outside the capital, those described as moderate conservatives who had supported Rouhani's nuclear pact, also did well. The two blocs combined now outnumber hardliners in parliament. That's another boost for the president. Though hardliners still control the most powerful institutions of the state, the elections mark a shift towards a more moderate political landscape in Iran. President Rouhani was able to mobilize the bulk of the political class behind the nuclear agreement. Some think the election will give him the power to move forward with his cautious reforms. He's been trying to improve Iran's relations with other countries, including the United States, as well as reforming the economy now that sanctions have been lifted, pushing to boost the private sector and encourage foreign investment. Though he's been less able to advance more progressive social change or secure the release of political prisoners. Time now to bring in our guests. In Berlin, Adnan Tabatabai, co-founder and CEO of the Center for Applied Research in Partnership with the Orient. In Tehran, Sadek Zebakalam, politics professor at Tehran University. And also in Berlin, Mohammed Shabani, Iran Pulse editor at new media organization Al Monitor. Welcome to you all. Let's go straight to Sadek Zebakalam in Tehran. Are these results being viewed as an endorsement of President Rouhani and his policies? Yes, I believe that uh, whichever way you interpret uh, the result, even by, by the interpretation of the hardliners, um, although they, they do not accept that we have been defeated, but uh, the very fact that they tried to cripple the reformists by disqualifying uh, almost the entire uh, reformist candidate, as well as uh, uh, supporter of uh, uh, Rouhani's um, the, the administration in, um, the, in many uh, uh, municipalities, Nevertheless, um, the combined um, alliance of the reformist uh, pro uh, Rouhani administration and moderate hardliners, they have managed to inflict, I think, um, um, uh, a crucial defeat on uh, particularly uh, hardliners uh, in Iran. Well, Adnan Tabatabai, uh, there's an important point being made by Sadek there, and let's make very clear that some of those who would be regarded as moderate were not allowed to stand in these elections, as has just been pointed out. That makes the success of the Rouhani supporters even more significant, does it not? It does indeed. I think what has been really significant here at this election is that the voters particularly those in Tehran, voted for a list, for an electoral roster, and not so much for persons or single candidates. Therefore, names didn't matter that much. Those who were on the list in Tehran, except for maybe Mohammad Reza Arif, who was the leading reformist figure, were not well known. But since there was the idea that these people are on the list of Arif, they got voted anyways. And I think this is a new interesting phenomenon, particularly in Tehran. Mohammed Shabani, uh, first of all, your view, uh, do you also see this as an endorsement of President Rouhani? I think what's happened in Iran is that uh, the meaning of change has changed. And uh, I think the blurring of lines in the center of the political spectrum has opened 
uh, a whole new array of possibilities of cooperation across old factional lines. Uh, Adnan was talking about the joint reformist moderate ticket in Tehran, where even two conservatives were included. I mean, that just goes to show the new political landscape that's being framed now in Iran. Uh, how far it will go, we're just going to have to wait and see. Well, Sadek Zubakalan, does, does this mean that there's been, in a way, a shift to the center in Iranian politics, that the radicals to the left and to the right are being peeled away, creating this center block of uh, people who would call themselves moderate conservatives? Yes, that has uh, that has been uh, really the the development in Iran the, uh, the, the, since the end of uh, Ahmadinejad uh, presidency, uh, 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 nearly uh, uh, two years and and, and, uh, and eight months ago. We can we can we can say uh, uh, that there have been a slow shift towards the center of uh, politics in Iran away from uh, anti-westernism anti-americanism that was uh, that was very much waged by uh, by uh, president ahmadinejad by the revolutionary guard and by other uh, hardliners however we mustn't expect that the hardliners grip to power uh, would be lifted uh, so so um, so easily uh, ever since the results in in Tehran came out they have been a bit damp quietened because they have been shocked uh, they have been surprised they have been baffled they couldn't believe that uh, uh, not a single of their uh, of their candidate could get into majlis more importantly uh, for the for the assembly of experts, which, which uh, in, in, in according to the constitution, uh, chooses uh, to, uh, uh, the supreme leader's successor, uh, they did very badly uh, there as well. Well, Adnan uh, Tabatabai, uh, this particular issue of the, the uh, assembly of experts, um, seeing somebody who did exceedingly well there is uh, former president Akbar Hasemi Rasvanjani. Um, so clearly, there is almost a kind of clean out uh, within the political system. We've seen it both in parliament, certainly in the Tehran bloc, and now in that assembly of experts who are very important in terms of determining who could be Iran's future leader, a supreme leader, or indeed what kind of form that leadership would take, is it not? Yes and no. On the one hand, of course, it's very interesting to see that the uh, actual chairman of the Assembly of Experts failed to get the proper votes. Uh, Mohammad Yazdi, Ayatollah Mohammad Yazdi, has not made it into the Assembly. And uh, Mr. Hashimi Rafsanjani, as you said, uh, managed to gain the most votes. And uh, the chairman of the Guardian Council, Ayatollah Ahmad Jannati, came in last as 16th. As much as that matters in terms of symbolism. It is not that much important formally. There is no more competency uh, when you're the one with the more with more votes than the one who came in 16th. And the secondly, I think what is important that these uh, factional lines, these ideas of partisanship, party politics, do not matter that much in the assembly yes, of experts and in the parliament. They actually only do matter in Tehran. Uh, Mohammed Shabani, so uh, I want to pick up it. on something that uh, Sadek uh, Zbaklang was saying, is that you cannot rule out the hardliners. They will not give Bashi, up their Bashi. grip on power easily, in your view. I think that it's not in Rouhani's interest to entirely eliminate them from elected institutions where they can have a say. I think if you do that entirely, you isolate them and then try to eliminate them, which is what the reformers tried to do in the past, you'll end up with the same result, which is a push pushback through unelected institutions. Um, I think in the long term, Rouhani's greater agenda is, again, to blur the lines in the center, to try to coax and poach principalists, people on the right-hand side of the political spectrum, to move towards the center, and at some point, from a position of strength, at some, in some kind of way, try to co-opt or cooperate with these hardliners. His idea is not to isolate anybody permanently. I don't think that's his goal. 
Well, as we've been saying, the change in the political landscape opens the way for changes to economic policy. Reforms are needed to strengthen the private sector, tackle corruption and encourage outside investment. Some deals have already been done with foreign businesses, including a $27 billion deal for 118 Airbus airliners. The government is seeking to increase oil output to match pre-sanctions levels. Also worth noting that since those sanctions were lifted, Iran has been able to access more than $100 billion of overseas assets that had previously been frozen in foreign bank accounts. Um, Adnan Tabatabai, to what extent is ongoing support for President Rouhani dependent on an improving economy? I believe that is the priority of the electorate. Um, the striking majority of Iranians are struggling hard to, to uh, foster some form of economic improvement in their everyday lives. And I think that that is the, the key demand of the voters, as it was back in 2013, to support the government and to have parliamentarians who push for economic improvement. That is, has to do with, uh, with the job market, with the single purchasing power of every citizen. These are things that are most urgent for the people, both in Tehran, but also in other regions and provinces. And therefore, economics, in my opinion, has been the, the key issue here. Mohammed Shabani, your, your view of that particular point of view, has economics and improving economies been a driving force in terms of this election result? I think definitely. I think Iranian votes, uh, Iranians, they vote with their pockets very much. You saw this again, as Adnan said, in 2013. But having said that, uh, you noted a, a $100 billion figure. Uh, in terms of Iran's released uh, frozen assets abroad. I think in, in reality, since most of that money actually belongs to the National Development Fund, other amounts are owed to the central bank, the actual amount of cash accessible to the government for it to spend is quite small. I would say it's about 20 percent of that sum. And if you look at, in, according to one study, the cost of the sanctions on oil and finances and banking cost Iran a grand total of 150 billion U.S. dollars. In comparison, it has been estimated that the cost of low oil prices will cost Rouhani 180 billion U.S. dollars. So Rouhani, just because he has a nuclear deal, a com not compliant, but let's say a cooperative parliament and a wide array of economic reforms, that doesn't mean he's out of the woods yet. He still has a huge amount of things to do on his economic agenda to be able to realize growth, make it trickle down, make it make a difference in people's everyday lives. I think that's what's going to matter the most. That's what's going to make sure whether he's going to be re-elected or not next year. Well, Sadek Zabakalam, what about foreign policy? Now, with these results behind him, is there likely to be a continuation in what we saw as an embryonic uh, policy being exercised by President Rouhani with regard to Saudi Arabia, for example, attempts apparently being made to begin to repair relations. Do you, are we going to see more of this? Is this going to be encouraged by the support he's received? Yes, I think um, there are uh, there are prospects, there are uh, hope that uh, maybe we would uh, once this parliament is uh, is uh, set uh, within the next. Uh, uh, four months or so, we would see uh, perhaps a, a new rapprochement, uh, a new drive by this parliament uh, f uh, exhorting pressure on, on Rouhani or rather persuading Rouhani um, to make a rapprochement with, with Saudi Arabia and uh, with other uh, the countries that uh, Iran during the past few years have uh, uh, fallen, uh, like Turkey, for example. Yes, I dare say we would, uh, we might, we might see some uh, changes in that direction. Well, Adnan Tabatabai, uh, what we will see, as though it is expected, is the hardliners digging in their heels and perhaps using any shift in foreign policy as a way in which to attack President Rouhani and those who support him, your view? I mean, parliament is not that influential in foreign policy making in Iran. Obviously, plenary sessions are often used to discuss some of the affairs, uh, regional affairs, national security issues, and of course, through that, there is some influence on the overall discourse. And 
If we consider that some of the most outspoken critics of this government, some of, some of the most outspoken critics such as MPs Hamid Rasai, uh, Mr. Hosseinian, uh, Mr. Bazarpash, Mr. Kuchakzade, these were very, very strong opponents of the nuclear file, of the nuclear agreement. These are no longer going to be, they will no longer be in parliament. So these very hard voices in parliament against f the foreign policy conducted by Hassan Rouhani will no longer be there. So I think that the criticism coming out of parliament will be less. Having said that, um, its influence is limited anyway. So I don't think that we will see major changes in how Iran conducts its foreign and regional policy after this election. Well, Mohammad Shabani, I mean, the foreign policy uh, sometimes is actually carried out by the Republican Guard on, on the ground. They have control of national security in effect. Is there the possibility of a push and pull happening of attempts by parliament to go in a particular direction being undercut by those who are intent on uh, maintaining or exercising their rights to guide the security issues of the nation? I think in some uh, theaters in the region, such as Iraq and Syria, the Revolutionary Guard are, are quite active as implementers of policy rather than uh, the source of policy. I think actual national security and foreign policy is formulated in the Supreme National Secu Security Council where the Revolutionary Guard have a representative. But so does President Rouhani, so does the foreign minister, so does the interior minister, so does the defense minister. I think in relation to regional policies and specifically Saudi Arabia, what's quite different to the nuclear issue in which you had a very broad consensus among different factions, among the population most of all, that Iran should engage in constructive engagement with the West Recent opinion polls have actually shown that a majority of Iranians do not favor negotiating with Saudi Arabia. This is quite problematic for Rouhani because right now he finds himself in a position, if these polls are true and accurate and reflect reality, where he does not only have to push back against hardliners, but against the electorate in order to engage in constructive engagement with you know, countries like Saudi Arabia. So it's quite complicated, the different dynamics at stake here. Having said that, I agree with Adnan that uh, Parliament is not a very active actor uh, when it comes to foreign policy. Constitutionally, it has to, all international agreements have, have to be ratified by Parliament. Parliament also has the ability to impeach ministers. They have summoned various ministers. They have impeached ministers in the past. So it's that kind of authority. It's less about shaping actual policy. Well, Asadek Zibakalam, uh, let's remind ourselves that in pushing through that nuclear deal, Rouhani was backed by the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, and also the Speaker of Parliament, Ali Larajani. Is their support likely to continue? Yes, there is no reason uh, uh, why we should uh, doubt uh, the support of the, the Supreme Leader, uh, as far as uh, the, the continuation of uh, the nuclear deal is concerned. But what I said about Saudi Arabia, of course, I do realize that uh, Majlis uh, doesn't uh, set the course for uh, the whether or not to have a rapprochement with Saudi Arabia. But we mustn't forget that, uh, that we, have, uh, we have new faces in, um, in, in Majlis. And uh, they could deliver uh, speeches about uh, the role that Iran is playing in Syria, for example, the degree of, um, of bitterness and animosity that, that is uh, building up between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, the, uh, if they talk in, the, in this way, then, then uh, maybe the more independent newspaper, the reformist inclined newspaper, they would uh, be more courageous um, to, to criticize our, uh, our policy in, in Middle East. What I'm really trying to say is that there is a potential scope for, uh, for criticizing Iran's um, uh, foreign policy. That doesn't necessarily mean that we would see um, a radical change in Iran's foreign policy. But, but the very fact that that you can question that foreign policy is, is an important step. Uh, Adnan Tabai, I, I see you nodding in agreement there. I, I take it you would agree with that point? 
I do. Um, as Professor Zibra Kalam said, the, the main decision makers, be it Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei or the most important figure in Parliament, the Parliamentary Speaker, who now still is Mr. Ladijani, I think the, the, the consensus about the nuclear file is, is, is unshakable. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, and as uh, Professor Zibra Kalam also just mentioned, uh, the fact that plenary sessions are broadcast live either uh, on radio and on TV, everyone can hear what is discussed there. And we have new faces, and there is the potential, as was just pointed out, that you have um, an alternative or a, a bit slightly different uh, discourse in Parliament. And uh, even though it might not, not, might not change anything immediately, it brings some more nuances into the whole regional debate. Mohammed Chabani, uh, the phrase there, it brings more nuances into the regional debate. I mean, clearly there's been a process since the agreement on the nuclear issue, which is uh, resulting in a greater democratization, it would appear, certainly in terms of freedom of thought, thoughts, freedom of speech, and has been mentioned repeatedly here, freedom to criticize uh, the, even the country's president. There has, I wouldn't call it democratization. What I would call it is a, is a push and pull against uh, some hardline forces. Uh, you have had an opening, a relaxation of some, aspect, some aspects of society, but on the other hand, you've had detentions of uh, more dual nationals. You have two Iranian Americans in jails right now, even though four others were released. So it's a constant push and pull. But I think this struggle is going in the right direction. And I think the parliamentary uh, elections and the assembly of experts elections show that most Iranians are in favor of this kind of uh, trajectory. Adnan uh, would you agree with that? There certainly seems to be a popular agreement on certainly the need for economic process, but these elections result indicate a degree of political unity among the center that has been absent from Iranian politics before. It seems as if the majority of Iranian voters um, do agree with the overall path that the Rouhani administration has laid out. Um, it seems that the whole idea of pragmatism Mohammed mentioned earlier is also um, at the heart of a lot of the, 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 the voting behavior. And this, in, in, uh, this is in fact a, a development which not only has to do with Iran's uh, domestic affairs, but also with, with what's going on in the region, with the catastrophes in Syria, in, in Libya, in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan. And Iranians are aware that uh, they are in, a, in quite a good position with what they have with a stable country. And they want to maintain this, and they want to make sure that uh, slow steps are taken before um, risks are, are coming up and may, in fact, uh, create some, some, some problems and chaos in the country. Well, Mohammed Chabani, very quickly, in summary, do you think there's reason for optimism in the Iranian political process? Has something happened in this vote uh, that promises something different in the future? I think the one key point of all of this is to recognize that the meaning of change in Iran has changed. The meaning of reform has changed. The changes we see today are not those of 10 years ago, but we're entering a whole new you know, atmosphere now where a lot of lines are blurring, new lines are appearing, and this, this is a way to open to see a lot of new possibilities. So we should be optimistic about that. Having said that, we should also be realistic. Um, so I, I, I'm personally quite hopeful, and I think um, the world should be hopeful as well. Well, a highly nuanced and uh, a deep, complex situation. But at that point, my thanks to all our guests, Adnan Tabatabai, Sadek Zibakalam, and Mohammed Shabani. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mike Hanna, and the whole team here, goodbye for now.